Welcome to this, uh, oh gosh, I'm not sure what number this is now, but uh, we're running this series of, of networking events uh, aimed at providing a forum for discussion and education in, in the world of retail and supply chain. I'm Frank Deans. Uh, I'll be moderating the, the session this morning. Uh, I'm Enterprise Business Development Lead at K3 Business Technologies Group. And I've been providing ERP and analytics software solutions into the, the retail sector for, oh gosh, over, over 15 years now. And the last three of those being with K3. I engage with customers and a reseller channel here in the UK and across the Nordic region, selling and supporting our solutions across brands and organisations such as Regatta, British Heart Foundation, Ted Baker, Columbia Sports Bear, and been working with uh, Copenhagen Business School as well. Now, K3 Business Technology, very briefly, it's a, we are we are a, a software provider based here in in Manchester in the UK, uh, with a number of sales and software development offices across the globe. Revenues uh, around the 70 million sterling mark and we employ approximately 500 people throughout those, those offices. We, we very much specialise in the retail and fashion sector and supply software platforms such as K3 Fashion, K3 Pebblestone and K3 Imagine into the market either directly with customers or through a reseller channel where we've got nearly 50 trained partner organisations throughout the globe. In addition to this, we partner with technology providers, people such as or companies such as Microsoft, Sage and CISPRO across these companies. But this morning, I'm delighted to welcome Maya Knights. Morning, Maya. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, Maya has over 20 years experience in a wide range of roles, including journalist, author and publisher, and does this alongside her work as a research analyst and consultant. She specialises in the use of technology in retail. She spent much of these 20 years investigating the challenges faced by retailers whilst exploring which technologies can best support their needs in addressing ever more complex consumer expectations and behaviours. And I think, uh, you know, talking as one of those consumers myself, I know how my expectations have uh, have increased throughout the uh, throughout the years. So uh, I'm sure it's it's something which we see with uh, through 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 all our lives. Yeah. Through this work, she's gained comprehensive knowledge and, and a real deep understanding of technology trends within this sector. But most recently, Maya served as Head of Industry Insight for Eagle Eye Solutions, which is a digital marketing technology provider and was instrumental in helping major retailers build best in class loyalty and promotions strategies. During her time there, she co-authored a book with uh, Tim Mason, and uh, I'm sure many of you will know Tim as the former deputy CEO of Tesco PLC. Um, name of that book is uh, Omnichannel Retail, How to Build Winning Stores in a Digital World. And this book was actually shortlisted for the 2020 Business Book of the Year Award. And prior to Eagle Eye, she was Global Technology Research Director at Planet Retail, where she also co-authored uh, another book, named Amazon, how the world's most relentless retailer will continue to revolutionise commerce. And, and I guess that's, uh, that's something which we will all keep an eye on. But she's not finished there because she's currently working on her second edition of this book, which is due to be published, uh, I think it's later this year, Maya here. Yeah. So hopefully you can see Maya brings a wealth of knowledge and, and experience to her screens today. Um, as she will explore how well thought out omnichannel strategies can carry retailers through this COVID crisis and out the other side with a more data driven relationship towards customers. We'll be, we'll be seeking to answer questions such as how can retailers get the most out of their physical stores today? 
what is the role of bricks and mortar in an increasingly digital world? And how can shops use technology to support store assistance and enhance, importantly, the, the customer experience? There's a lot of um, very current uh, themes there, I think, for sure. But I'll leave Maya to introduce herself further. But hopefully at this point, it's sufficient to say that she's very active and has been very active in the world of retail, including fashion and apparel. But before we move into the event any further, I'd like to thank all our attendees this morning for spending their time with us and, and just outline a few housekeeping points. First of all, uh, we, we really hope this will be a bit of a, a, an interactive session with you. We are here to listen as much to your thoughts and experiences as well as provide you with information. So please keep your camera on and feel free to ask questions and engage with us. Maya will be presenting for the next 40 minutes or so, and then we will open up to sort of general questions. But in the meantime, if there are any burning questions, any thoughts or observations as, as we go through or as Maya goes through her presentation, please post them in the chat panel, which you can see in the on-screen on tools. And we will, we will pick these up at, at an appropriate point as we go, or indeed we'll, we'll just save them up to the end and uh, we have a, a bit of discussion at the end, but certainly uh, previous events, we've we've always had a, a very open and 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 I must admit thought uh, provoking uh, sharing of experiences uh, at, at the end of a presentation. So so I'm sure this one uh, will be ex exactly the same. Um, I'm, I'm glad to say that we've got people attending from from throughout the uh, the, the the Nordic region and and in fact as far as Greece. So we have uh, Sweden, we have Ireland, we have. Uh, Norway, we have Germany, we have a whole host of, of people this morning, so, so thanks again. What you might find though is that there is a, a bit of feedback or maybe a little bit of echo or noise across the system. Um, so please, when when Maya or when others are, are speaking, uh, please uh, remember and turn your mics off. That should, uh, should certainly help uh, prevent that from happening. And finally, just to say we will be recording the event today for those who may have registered and, and couldn't attend for whatever reason. So just to alert you to that. Um, and at the end, Kelly Fleming, our events manager, will share with you some market research which we have conducted recently. So that will be emailed out to you probably from I think it's about Thursday onwards, Kelly. I remember in the conversation um, but that's some research was based on a survey of of over 2000 consumers uh, in conjunction with a company called Sapio Research and that explores what retailers need to get right to retain customers, to drive loyalty and to increase sales now. Um, so yeah, that's as, that's really as much as I, I'd like to say uh, and I will hand the baton across to Maya now and uh, look forward to hearing uh, what uh, what she's got to present to us. Okay Maya, take it away. Okay Frank, hopefully everybody can hear me and mm -hmm. see my screen. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and um, really good housekeeping. Um, I, I did, ugh, I always say I'm not here really <clears throat> because of, of 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 what I've done. It's it's more the fact that what I do is to try and take that thirty thousand feet view on the retail world that you all spend your days and nights eating, sleeping, thinking about, and try and distill some of the trends that we've seen into some takeaways that you can take to your business take to your stakeholders and 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 champion the the consumer because at the end of the day we're all consumers i'm a very passionate shopper um which was the one thing frank left out of my bio but that's what brings me here today um to talk about digital transformation and how to win with customers in a post-pandemic world so thank you so much to k3 
for allowing me to um, spend this time with you today. As Frank said, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So please do use the chat and um, I'll bring Frank in at certain points if, if he has, if there are any questions coming through because I can't see them on my screen. Um, if you do want to jump in, but as well, obviously there's the Q and A. Um, and thank you so much, as I said, to K3. Um, as I said, my job really isn't to bluster about who I am. You get into presentations and they're already telling you about their company and how they're gonna sell to you before they actually tell you what they do and what the benefits are and who they've done it for. So let's try and reach some kind of consensus in terms of what has changed. Now, I think it's pretty obvious by the opening slide that uh, what's changed is digital. I keep getting asked um, in the last sort of 18 months if what COVID has changed. And I think you'll, have, you'll agree most experts um, are saying that actually COVID hasn't really changed anything. It's only accelerated the changes that we've already seen, which I suppose is a, a good thing. And we'll look a bit more at that in a moment in terms of who the winners are. But um, it really pays to bear in mind that nothing has changed. Change is everything. There's something to be said when movies, music, maps, messaging, memories all go digital. But the point I'm here to try and stress is that that has happened already. We all have access to all of this capability at, in the palm of our hands, at the touch of our, our fingertips, um, wherever we go all day, every day. Where has this led us? Staying with mobile, because I really think it is the apex example of the change that we're seeing now today amongst consumers, I wanted to share with you some recent research from App Annie. Consider that there's been a 24% year-on-year growth in the number of shoppers using apps and $143 billion spent in app during 2020 and that was amongst um, within 3.5 trillion hours spent on mobile on android alone globally that on android amounted to 25 percent year on year growth and in the uk amounts to 20 percent growth um, worldwide retail e-commerce sales grew 27.6 percent totaling 4.28 trillion and this one I quite like as a bit of a mind blower. In the second half of 2020, the average American being one of the largest consumer markets in the world, watched 3.7 hours of TV a day, but actually spent four hours on mobile, which means in a really um, very real sense, mobile apps are, are now bigger than television. And if you really want to understand where this change has hand out to, let's have a look at who the winners are. Because whenever there's change, there's winners and losers. And I think you can see the big tech companies have been the biggest stock market winners during the pandemic. This FT chart shows companies with net market gain of more than 1 billion in 2020 by sector. The circles show the market cap added year to date. This chart was generated June 2020 with the top 100 highlighted and the top 25 labelled. And as is so relevant for us today as retailers and retail watchers, it's no surprise that Amazon was the biggest winner, adding 401 billion, um, billion market cap, followed by Microsoft, 269, Billion, Apple with 219 billion and Tesla at 108. I also um, give out, uh, give a call out to Tencent in communications there with 93 billion added in market cap. When you consider what the winners have, how big the winners have won, I like to borrow a, a phrase that my co author from um, Amazon, Natalie Berg has used, which is to say that the pandemic has essentially finished what Amazon started in 1995. Having highlighted the change and the winners, I do want to just again draw attention to the chat box and let you jump in with any questions you might have. 
but that might be too early on in, in the presentation. Let me tell you why these winners have won and what those drivers have been. Now, I think we've become very good at connecting digitally to places and to things. I think retailers have spent the last 40, 50 years automating systems. I remember doing an interview with BBC Radio years ago about the 50th anniversary of the barcode. Cool. I think automation um, has, per has become pervasive and, and, and on the heels of automation, Digital has become almost as pervasive in the back office of retailers and up to the shelf edge of retailers when it comes to dealing with their store associates. We see places, the utility, if we think about that as consumers, we're able to get navigate from A to B as easily as, we, as, as, as Google Maps makes it for us. And latterly, we're starting to connect to things digitally where we're seeing the advent of the internet of things, smart devices, self-configuration, predictive maintenance. I hear retailers wax lyrical and their vendors perhaps even more wax lyrical about the savings and efficiencies and productivity gains to be made with these things. But very, very rarely do we hear retailers championing, connecting, automating that connection and digitizing that connection to people because I believe it becomes so much more complex. It becomes something slightly more amorphous that's more difficult to manage. It becomes around how you communicate purpose and trust and transparency and bring that element of personalization into a relationship that consumers are increasingly expecting. You're not connecting with your customers, even though the point I'm trying to make is that they are your most valuable connection now that the world has gone digital. Where is this mo writ most large? And I think this is very, very prescient, seeing as a lot of countries have had lockdowns. I mean, March last year, over half the globe was under lockdown. And it's pretty patchy at the moment, but most non-essential stores have suffered. Most essential stores have seen a massive boom, but everybody's minds, as we think about vaccinations and a, a new normal is focusing on where does this massive, massive hockey stick acceleration in digital and massive growth in online shake out with the stores? Where does that leave stores? Well, for me, unfortunately, I think stores are a bit of a digital black hole. Uh, as I said, you can use your mobile device to create a shopping list, research what you want to buy, map your journey there, create a wish list, get to the store door, and you tend to put your phone away. I think the more often you take your phone out when you're in store now is potentially a measure of how digitally enabled that store is. I see a lot of consumers using their mobiles nowadays in grocery stores, being essential stores, they're open. And I, and I note that grocery retailers have embraced um, scan and pay, contactless systems, where you're bagging and scanning, scanning and bagging and paying for your own goods um, all in one go, which I think is an extension of doing the labor for them from self-checkout anyway. But nevertheless, these are utilitarian functions what I would like to see is that the stores are given a real mobile makeover. Um, by that, I mean highly to commend the book by Stephen Shamba, Mobile Makeover, but also to highlight the fact that consumers want to see more tech introduced into store to remove friction and make it easier, more convenient, more um, seamless and smooth a journey. Um, I would suggest consumers need to introduce digital. Specifically, consumers are already using self-checkout facilities, 56% of them in the high street, but there's even more demand for that. There's a similar story when you, get, when you talk about scan and go provision. Uh, where shoppers can you know, use their technology to scan products via a retail app and then check out 
34% are already using this tool, but 26% say they do not have the option on their high street and would like to see that. When you consider that we have spent the last 15, 16 months locked down, shopping mostly by digital, where Amazon has been the run runaway winner, as Frank said at the top of the conversation, our expectations have heightened, and I do believe that that's going to make consumers much, much more um, discerning about visiting stores. They're going to want to need to be incentivized to visit a store. And actually, my last point on this slide would be that the anecdotally, the, the, the reports I'm hearing from retailers are that when they do open stores, when they do put things like appointment booking systems and traffic light queuing systems that are um, available in app or, or online that consumers can check what the queue is like before they actually make a journey that consumers are turning up to their stores with um, having done much deeper levels of research but therefore having higher levels of purchase intent they're converting higher and basket sizes are also higher as well there may be leaving planning their journeys to stores and leaving it till they can get more things than the occasional shopping item so there's an opportunity there as well as to over in, in, in overcoming these challenges where i think you're going to have some consumers coming those that want to coming back to store really keen and hungry to interact hungry to engage hungry to spend so what does that mean strategically I've talked about the digital connection to your customers that you already have, that some of you will have seen customers digitally online for the first time um, uh, ever, than ever before and more than ever before. So the point of digital and the point of creating that connection and nurturing that connection is to know who your customers are and what they want because they are constantly leaving those digital breadcrumbs from, from what, whether it be clickstream activity right through to the actual personally identifiable information they might share with you if they check out and register. And through that, you know what they want because you can kind of understand what they're buying. But when you transfer that to mobile, when you have the native capabilities, the geolocation and tracking capabilities, if you incentivize them to make it valuable enough, you can actually understand not just who they are and what they're buying, but where they are when they buy and what it is that's influencing the context that's influencing their journey. The reason I wrote the book that Frank mentioned, Omnichannel Retail, which this presentation is based on, with Tim Mason, former deputy CEO of Tesco's, was because he's actually affectionately known as Mr. Club Card. And I have to say, I borrowed this from him and Dun Humby, who originated the data science behind Club Card. And this was the original blueprint for Club Card to thank customers so that they may know a little bit more about them so that they can serve them better. So if you think about it, loyalty schemes were kind of a proxy for digital nowadays. And I think drawing, inf drawing an inference even further, what we've seen with the emergence of subscriptions with, again, Amazon being the apex example with Prime, is that subscriptions have become a, a proxy for loyalty. But again, the one common denominator is that digital connection that enables it and that allows you to know so much more about your customers so that you can serve them better. So if you have this connection, what do you do about it? You need to infer the why. You need to know who your best customers are so that you can go out and find more like them. When Tesco's asked customers to identify themselves and Tesco's thank them, Tesco's customers opened their wallets even further. And that was 25 years ago, 1995, the same year that, um, uh, that Amazon was launched and a year after eBay was launched. So it just shows that the, nothing has really changed. It's just the means and ways of accessing it and what you can do with it, which is so much more, which is so much more powerful that has changed. 
I would also just draw your attention to the two know who your best customers are, because I'm sure you all have experienced rising, exponentially rising costs of digital customer acquisition. And it is my contention that retailers need to understand who those best customers are across both online and in store in order to be able to go and find more like them and cut that cost of digital acquisition. Once you've started to build up a picture of the who, what, when and why, I'm going to borrow another acronym from Dunhumby and Clubcard, which is called DIAL. And if you approach the digital connection that gives you the data that allows you to connect to the customer with, an, with the intent to get insight from it and to drive action from that insight, you can then use that, make sure those actions are designed to incentivize and drive loyalty. You manage what you measure. With, data, with Dial, data leads to insight, driving action that promotes loyalty. But too often, I see retailers mistaking it for data leading to a bit of interesting kind of analysis that they learn from, that they then go out and find more data about. It is closely related, but it's not the same. I mean, what is the point of learnings if they aren't used to actually action functional and emotional loyalty, if they actually aren't used to run your business better? So I would suggest that you use the digital connection with your customers to, in, to, to infer the why from the data they share with you and ensure the customer offer is designed to incentivize the behavior you seek. Nowadays, when we talk about brands with purpose, when we talk about um, an increased um, interest in sustainability and clean beauty, I believe consumers are looking to retailers to use the, de the data that they share with them with empathy to demonstrate their purpose and relevance. The objective is to know who your customers are. Who are my best customers? Who are my pleasure seekers? Who are my bargain hunters? Only then can a business understand the savings to be made in giving away only what's essential. I would just draw um, attention to one last stat here, which is I always mention it's Harvard Business Review research carried out in 2017. And I still quote it because I've still not seen it done any better. It is um, uh, 47,000 US consumers and Harvard Business Review found essentially that those that shop across channels are worth 10% more per visit online and 4% more per visit in store when compared to single channel shoppers. So these are your best customers. Understand who they are, use the data with sympathy, incentivize the, the behavior you seek, and only then can you understand who are those that only will buy with you, from you with a bargain, with, a, with an offer? Who are those that will want something exclusive, like a reward, for example? Now, I'm getting into the end of my presentation, so I will just hopefully ask, um, ask that um, you can hopefully use the chat box. And uh, if there are any questions coming that are burning, I can pause for them now. But if not, I shall. My, Maya, there, there, there yeah. has been, <clears throat> I think uh, D David Spittle has, um, has been very active here. Um, a couple of, couple of questions that he's asked. Uh, and perhaps David, you, you could uh, unmute and uh, and add to this if I, I pick it up incorrectly. A really, really interesting one at the at the start where uh, he's asking uh, the question essentially: Isn't there a tortoise and hare analogy somewhere here? Um, how much will there be a snapback to somewhere between 2019 and today? So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing yeah. If David, if you're looks like you've gone off mute, if you want to add to that, that'd be good. Yeah. So the, the way I see it is, of course, there are going to be digital winners on that. Don't really like the words digital in in that sense. So online winners is probably a better way of putting it, uh, because people are being, you know, people still want to shop and they're being driven online through the lack of availability to go into a store. Once stores open. Will the winners still be winners, or will there be a will they've had a temporary? So 
at what point will Amazon still be on their current sales drive level? Uh, I mean, I have three teenage daughters who are itching to get back onto the high street. And so the money they've spent online will then be spent in store. So you know, who will the winners be in five years' time? Who will the winners be in five years' time? Very good question. Um, I believe those that are still winning with digital are going to continue. I think you're right. Um, sorry, David, if I could ask you to mute just while... Got a bit of an echo in my head. Thank you. It's so hard to answer your question when I've got a mute, um, my, my, my own voice echoing in my head. Um, <clears throat> so I would point to the research of eMarketer, which has been very um, pragmatic and pointed to a slowing. I think most analysts are, are pointing to uh, have a consensus um, that e-commerce growth will definitely slow next year. Um, and this year, rather, to, uh, so we're looking at 2020 figures versus 2021 figures. Um, but I think the winners will be those that combine the often online offer in a, in a more seamless way that embrace digital in their stores. I would point to um, the I, figures by the IMRG, which is the UK, what they call multi-channel retailer trade body. And year in, year out, they find that um, multi-channel retailers, as they call them, those with brick and mortar and an online presence, engender greater levels of trust. Um, they obviously have a, a model that's set up to be more convenient in terms of I can click and collect, I can return to store. Um, they also, um, they have made more gains during the pandemic, I think that when consumers have been driven online, as you say, David, they've gone to those retailers that they tend to recognize on the high street. And they'll go back to those that they tend to recognize on the high street. But what will shake out is that those that have embraced the identity of that customer that they've recognized online, but choose not to embrace that, that identity and recognize them and value them and thank them for being the customer in store in the same way as well, are the ones that are going to suffer. David, does that, do you want to come off mute and let me know? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I agree with everything you say. I mean, I, previously I've, I've, I've um, compared it to like a, an elastic band, you know, you can pull it and it stretches. Uh, and then it will, you know, if you let go, it will, it will snap back. And that's where my snap back comment came from. Mm -hmm. But it will, won't have the same tersile strength it originally had. So there will always be a bit of a loosening. I know it, it's it's a similar, I guess, a similar debate into will people go back to the office? Um, mm. Yes, it won't be what it was, but it won't be what it is now. Mm. Uh, and I think it, I think the debate is oh, where is that real middle ground? Mm. Uh, and then you think what Primark is, is not doing uh, conspicuously um, and don't seem to have a problem with not having an online presence. Oh, I don't know about that. I'd, I, I would argue yeah. strongly about that. <laughs> they lost two billion yeah. pounds last yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay, take Primark as an example. I I used the the phrase um, ensure the customer offer is designed to incentivize the behaviour you seek. I have a real problem with fashion retailers <laughs> in the sense that they are not doing that. They're not making it easy for me to buy one size. They're making it. They're making it. Making me buy three sizes and return three and, and return two. If I were Primark, I would. I would say. Well, I would say what Tim Mason would say at this point is where there's a will, there's a way. Um, I when I go into the Oxford Street store or the Tottenham Court Road store, I see people turning up with suitcase, actually buying the suitcases to fill with Primark clothes. So I think Primark is well within its rights to say, I'm only going to do click and collect and I'm only going to do it over baskets of 150 pounds. It, it, at least the service is there if customers want it. To just outright say, I am not going to sell online is the height of arrogance and it's not putting your customer first. If you just look at Primark social media through the pandemic, it's customers pleading with them to offer them something, some way of buying online. There's a, a grey market of Primark goods that Primark has no view of because of their decision. And, and yeah, you've got me going now. That's a real hot topic for me. But this, I think, hopefully, in, in, in me having a little bit of a rant about Primark, it, it really does 
bring bring to life what I'm trying to say about designing an offer to incentivize the behavior you seek. And, and there is so much more that can be done with digital in terms of designing that offer, measuring the effect of that offer and iteratively improving on it. Mm. Yeah, and that, that's a good point, Maya. And, and I think certainly the, the you know, the, the point you make about people bringing clothing back and so on, it, it's certainly something which has been in the industry for many, many years. In fact, when, when you know, those of us that know the old catalogues, um, you can go back and I know that there are, uh, there is an organisation which we deal with in Germany, who in fact have, who is, who have been historically a catalogue, you know, a very traditional catalogue organisation. And they have 70% of their sales, in fact, are returned, um, So, which is a colossal amount. But they have been going for years and years and years. And I think if the business model uh, you know, takes that into account and, and allows them to survive, then then that uh, that seems to be uh, seems to be you know, say, oh, not OK in this day and world, this day and age. And certainly these days with um, where the consumer is very I think very more, uh, much more environmentally aware, and you know, from a sustainability point of view. And there have been there have been organisations that uh, some some retailers which we've spoken of, who are really looking to use technology to to avoid that 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 type of scenario that that you've um, that you've touched on there. And, and I don't mean that just from the online point of view, but I do mean from uh, um, from perhaps doing things like. You know, having fitting, I wouldn't call them salons, but having software which helps them to, uh, you know, to to imagine you know, virtually the the goods actually on on themselves. You know, there are there are a number of um, software offerings out there that, that do that do that for for companies, and certainly from where we we sit as as an organisation and a specific look at K3 fashion as well, and extending the the whole thing into the sustainability uh, piece. Um, you know, we do see a, a huge number of of organisations these days having sustainability at their heart. You know, and people should I say like uh, Sea Salt and Cornwall, Sea Salt Cornwall, for example. That's that was very much part of where where they started. Um, you know, it's part of the ethos, uh, and and they these days as well. It's um, you know they live and breathe, and and certainly that. Um, I guess that uh, eth you know that ethical approach is you know we see that very much uh, coming through in in the the goods not just in the goods that they supply but looking back into the the supply chain and and a yes. number of yeah a number of organisations have uh, have released sustainability reports and and show how they are using technology uh, you know to to assist them with with that yeah. Yeah, well, I, 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 it, you make me think of the research that I've had a quick sneak peek at that you said um, you were going to share with the, the attendees yeah. after that. And I note, I note that, you know, almost half of consumers want retailers to offer more product repairs, two and five want more upcycling initiatives. You're absolutely right. This is what I mentioned about being a brand with a purpose. If you're born as a brand with a purpose, like mm. Sea Salt, and so many of these direct-to-consumer brands that I see emerging nowadays, they've gone narrow but deep if you're a general retailer with a large high street presence that brand with that purpose hasn't been necessarily baked into your brand and so you're right that we're seeing a lot more sustainability initiatives but to pick up on yours and david's point i point i think we need to see a pincer movement we need to see so many of them are shouting about sustainability in the back office and the supply chain but aren't actually addressing the returns black hole at the front end or the recycling black hole at the front end. So while you were talking, I, I um, recalled that John Lewis, I'm not sure it's the right way yeah. to go about it, but they're, in, they're trialing massive great AR fitting booths where you go in and you're measured. I mean, they've been around for an absolute age, um, but I would commend the IKEA app, um, furniture fitting, you know, furniture, furniture um, viewing yeah. app and, Nike has had huge success with its AR shoe fitting service. I know um, more homegrown hotter shoes is looking at that and they're specifically looking at that, I think really clever way of 
to David's point about incentivizing, well, not necessarily needing to incentivize customers, but to make more of customers, um, the customer experience and customer shopping journey when they come in, they're going to try and onboard people onto the app, get them to do the AR fitting there and then take it home. You know, if someone like Clark's, who I think might be experimenting with this, then layered on the subscription model for child shoes yeah. you know you you would you would be affecting not just the amount of reverse logistics you have to deal with but also the ultimate goal which is creating an absolutely seamless shopping experience mm -hmm. that that you know takes the pain yeah. the friction out of it so there are plenty of examples i think it would be great if a retailer could look itself in the eye and say, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can on all the fronts. I think most of them will say that they're doing a lot on some of the fronts, but there aren't many I can think of that are doing everything on every front. Um, I'd call out H&M and Gap. Um, they've all got recycling bins in there for their clothes in, in their stores now, although H&M was caught out few years ago in its home market burning mountains of clothes um, and also a huge bugbear for me is beauty products which always seem designed not to be able to let you get that last little bit of really expensive product out but then kind of expect you to just chuck that in the bin because it's not recyclable so I've seen L'Oreal setting up um, recycling bins next to their concessions in department stores for example there's so much that can be done so much Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just looking into the uh, the chat panel here, and uh, uh, I know David. You've, David Spittle has been uh, he's he's popped another couple of points in, which we'll pick up on, David. But and there's one from uh, and and Andy Howell here, which um, Andy, I wonder if you can uh, open up and just uh, share with with the audience the the points that you make here. Yeah, sure. So. I think I feel like I've been harping on about this for a while, but <laughs> it's this concept of that truly connected customer experience. I've put a Wally phrase around it that was channel symbiosis, this kind of truly connected experience where you essentially take your in-store customer, you take them online to have the next phase of their journey. You take the online experience into social and then you move that into app and you can then recreate that online experience in-store as well. So I guess my my sort of feeling around all that is that we've got this amazing uh, landscape that's been created for e-commerce over the last sort of year, this massive adoption across all uh, generations, you know, huge rises in, in capability. We've got smartphone proliferation really at a stage where it needs to be. And I completely take your point, David, and I was trying to think of a smart way of getting around the, the dynamic MAC addresses, but I suppose it comes all the way around to loyalty. But I my question really is, is this now the time for retailers to really open their eyes and say, you know what, we've got this opportunity, the education's at an all time high, the fear factor perhaps around generations who weren't as, if you like, easy to jump over that chasm into adopting technology is kind of somewhat dissipated because of the pandemic. You know, have we reached that tipping point basically? That's kind of my question, a bit long -winded. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Do you know, do, do you know what Andy, that's, that's it's, I, I, agree with you so much um, <laughs> on everything you said and I think you know a really good measure on this side of the pond of whether or not we've meet, reached that tipping point was the Amazon Fresh launch a couple yeah. of weeks ago and who would have thought I've put this on social media so it's not original but who would have thought Amazon would be able to play up the low touch health and safety advantages of its just walk out technology um, which I think you know encapsulates what you're saying about that 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 piece of education that tipping point where everybody's been touched by digital now the point I would make there is that when I was at Eagle Eye, we did some global research um, across consumers. And I've done this research so many times as, a, as an analyst, where you ask, I'm sure you've all done it as well, what are the major influences of, uh, that, 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 that influence you to choose a particular brand or retailer? And you give a lot of, you know, a lot of lots of options, and you can guarantee year in, year out for the last 15 years I've been doing it, price will come top. You kind of almost have to strip out price to get any meaningful data from the rest. But then over the last decade, I've seen the top three, the top, the, the sort of top five built below the, the price 
change as digital has, um, uh, you know, as consumers have adopted digital. Um, it used to be proximity, you know, mm. the three P's we used to talk about. Um, then five, six years ago, it used to be do they offer click and collect would be sort of third or fourth. Bearing in mind, I did this for a loyalty firm, um, did this research for a loyalty firm, but I was really surprised that um, second was promotions. So if you can't beat me, if you can't beat, beat, beat them on price, make me think I'm getting a deal. That was second. But third, to the point that we're making here, is um, offers a loyalty, loyalty or reward scheme that recognizes me for my continued custom. And that was quite profound for me. I mean, it was, it was third. It, you know, I think it was about 84% of consumers said this. But to me, what I think that translated to was when I walk into a store, I might as well be a one-time anonymous cash paying customer. I might shop with you loads online, but even those truly omni-channel relationships that we've cultivated with grocers, for example, I walk into the store and you have, you the grocer, have, offered me digital touch points from a utility standpoint that helped me get through the store quickly so that you don't have to do so much of the labor. Great. But where is, where's all the other stuff? Where's all the immersive stuff? Where's all the making it fun, making it easy, making it convenient, making it as fast as possible. There is none of that yet. So it's that recognizing me for my continued custom. So I think you guys, I can't see the chat, but you're talking about MAC addresses. And this is what loyalty was able to do, the loyalty scheme was able to do. And I think that's why you've seen so many grocers and those that have loyalty schemes double down on them in the last three to five years. It's because it's a way of getting your customer to identify themselves online and in store. So you can start to get that 360 degree view. But loyalty, you don't necessarily have to have a loyalty scheme so much anymore when they are actually itching to get their phones out when they're in your stores nowadays. They're probably getting their phones out to price compare at the shelf edge, if not check out. So if they've got their phones in their hands, engage them there. If you can incentivize them to identify themselves at the point of sale, then you do get the full trend of who, what, when, why, where, et cetera, et cetera, and all the lovely inference that you can apply AI systems to try and um, to, to, to understand the why. But, but it's, it is that recognizing the customer, both online and in store, um, according, to ha according to their value that I just don't see happening at the moment. Yeah, no, yeah, I think there's an interesting. Uh, I think there's an interesting point there, actually, which you know, it's kind of like what's the currency of loyalty, and it, it plays a bit for me into this concept around sustainability being perhaps the new currency. I mean, we just we just did a little bit of research uh, at K three around environmental credentials, ethical credentials, sustainability, showing that I think we saw that thirty percent uh, currently would 30% of you know, consumers affect their purchasing decisions based on sustainability credentials and it's expected to rise to 50 next year and I just feel like perhaps there's there's this interesting initiative or this interesting potential opportunity for retailers to really zero in on loyalty and sustainability and that online meets in store piece to reduce say something practical like returns and refunds because you're able to use the smart initiatives of online in an in-store environment and affect that great experience and that loyalty and that sustainability. So I'll just wrap it up in a very, very simple execution. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and so I think that's the secret to it as well, Andy, is, is keeping keeping it simple for, for the consumer, you know, and uh, I think Marcus Sardiman make, makes a really good point here about rebuilding retail um, and, and re really rebuilding that is all about um, you know, consumers being time poor effectively, yeah, and people today who are, are not travelling to work and having that extra time to go online and, and to work, you know, see what's happening through through the uh, the online uh, channel, as it were. And you know, but as time progresses, they will they will have that. We'll be able to get out. We will be able to get into the stores, and 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 we will do that at the weekend because I mean, let's face it, certainly here in the UK, and 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 certainly what I see in figures across Europe, 
you know, it, it's almost shopping and going out and meeting people out there is is a national pastime. It's a, you know, I hate to say it's it's almost a sport, but uh, it is very very much <laughs> that, that that way. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah so, so thanks for that that point, Marcus. Uh, absolutely the case. I think yeah. And David is pointing up. David Spettel is pointing out some more more points uh, regarding um, phone technology and perhaps phone technology. Uh, you know, I mean, let's face it, 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 phone technology, and certainly I've seen it in financial services, you know, has changed, has, you know, has brought on new business models in, in, um, in financial services. It's changed the way we all approach the, uh, you know, the shopping experience, um, you know, starting with how we, we you know, how we explore our, our finances, as it were. Um, but David makes a good point here about, you um, actually using QR technology as opposed to perhaps the eye beacons that you know we've seen in in certain stores and I think you mentioned earlier on about proximity um and you know yes. and also facial recognition from the cameras or from not even facial recognition but actually you know dwell time analysis from cameras and, and things of that through stores so um you know yes. that technology piece is is it's probably uh, in order that that retailers get the most out of it. I would say is more a um, a combination of technologies as opposed to relying only on one. How how would you how would you view that, Maya? Yeah, I think you know I tend to just lump in-store technology together. But when mm. I start to split it out, and we're going to come onto this in a sec, actually, we're going to talk about solutions. And that's the last slide for me, by the way. So okay. I think we're still on time. Keep me to time, Frank. Mm. Um, uh, what's the best way of managing this? So I mentioned Amazon Go. It's not many stores, not many retailers that can go, actually, I feel a bit cheap. I'm going to be a pick and choosy like I let into my store. There's not one retailer that's ever sort of said that. You know, they, they like to throw their doors open and, you know, be um, all, welcome all comers. But I think they have to be capable of recognising the best ones when they come in there. Um, and they have to be capable of establishing and nurturing a relationship that could go on to, to, to be, be your best customer when they're in there um let's in fact let me let me move on to this because you guys have been looking at this for ages so i was talking about i think this answers it um i talked about utility and i think we're moving from an age of automation and efficiency to an age where we need to think more about autonomy and self-service in the store but that can actually make the journey more immersive and interesting but at the basics people want information yeah. i think about digital shelf edge labels that we are going to mention so many in this slide we are going to mention so many technologies who retailers have told me are looking for a solution to solve a problem to solve their solutions looking for problems to solve and actually what what you could say is that the ground has come up to meet these solutions now. And I think retailers really need to start looking at them in the round um, seriously to digitally enable their stores. So, you know, here I've got um, an example of, uh, you know, recipe information, which if you're a food retailer, you've got tons of, why aren't you surfacing it through an app? I still hear retailers say, well, I don't need an app. Progressive mo mobile web is fine for me, thanks. Web, web apps are fine for me, mm. thanks. But actually, to David's point, your point, and, and Andrew's point, Andy's point. Um, if you have, you can't take advantage of the native capabilities of a mobile, which add that context um, wrapper around the interaction and the engagement, the the geolocation, the um, the ability to be able to to add filters with AR to help your customers interact with the store. So yeah, shelf edge labels for information mm -hmm. is one. Inspiration. This is an example of the Burberry store, and the Burberry store's been open for years, and we're still using it as an example for fashion, because you know that one you you that uses RFID, another old <laughs> French barcodes. I'm sorry, QR codes, shelf edge labels, RFID embedded hangers that then um, react to the signage. There's an example, short lived one, because I think the retailer went bust but I think I know Superdry equipped their store associates with tablets and then made those tablets 
um, interactive with the larger digital signage in the store. So if they're trying to cross an upsell, and by the way, your store associates, I don't want to talk about, you know, mobile enabling the store and taking away the human element. I think you have to give as much information, empower your store associates to be the best brand advocates they can be because they are your best and your biggest, most expensive asset to have as much information as the customer, to have more information than the customer. Too often we as customers walk into the store and feel that we know more than the person that we draw to the shelf edge to say, well, God, there's the space, where is it? And they'll go, oh, hold on a second, I'll just check in the back room. Days of that are just gone. I don't have time to wait for you to check in the back room anymore. Oh, I'm off. Um, so, you know, putting all of this in, in the hands of the, the store associate, I have to say, is so important. Um, and the store associate can actually add that huge dimension of inspiration. Sometimes I've been in a store and I'm trying on something which I really shouldn't be trying on because it's a little bit too expensive. And the store associate will go, oh, you look lovely in that. And that's it. I, I've bought it. Um, another really great example I will always tell is of the... Um, uh loss prevention officer chief loss prevention officer of american apparel in america um again a uh, years ago but he said to me they invested huge amounts of money in a new digital cctv system and so they were able to do that whole thing where you're tracking the you, you're able to time stamp each uh transaction and so you could pick up on fraudulent transactions and also point out training issues with with cashiers for example but the one benefit that they didn't think that they didn't look for that they didn't think that they would get is that they noticed that where they had a greeter on the door of a store shrink just dropped that day that hour and it's simply because someone's come when you're walking into a store and someone's saying hello I'm here if you need me to help you if that person has theft on their mind and they know that they've been clocked by a human being who might watch them walk around the store because obviously they're being attentive and they want to be able to step in and help serve them but actually it's going to stop them stuffing something in their bag shrink dropped so there is a there is definitely something to be said for you know using the digital technology to empower your store associates as well but I think another really important one that you can only bring through the technology to help the store associates bring this out, if not in front of the customer in app or, or online it, it themselves, is that relevance. Um, if the customer opts in to be recognized while they're in store, make sure you're showing them stuff that's relevant. I would love um, to be able to set up a wish list before I go in and to be navigated around the store as quickly as possible take me from a to b yes you don't you might you want me to dwell by your lovely merchandising um displays but i am going to see them just take make sure you're facilitating a journey that means i'm navigating the store in as efficient way as possible this example here is a really really simple one um uh, startup um has has created a, a google filter and I know Sainsbury's has um, integrated it so that if you were to view the Sainsbury's uh, grocery site through Chrome, having downloaded this filter, all you would see is filter vegan product. Simple. I'm vegan. I, I, I'm not vegan. But if I were vegan, that would be an amazing tool for me to have. Why not allow them to set that up in their own app view, for example, as they walk around a store? Um, help them find where the vegan section is for example um i think anything that can add that utility but personalize it make it more relevant has got to be very very powerful um and then as i mentioned navigation shopping malls crikey shopping malls could really do with this because i don't know how many people are going to want to hang around touch screens nowadays those big flash touch screens that they have on every you know mezzanine level by the escalators um, that's a basic one. And then finally, convenience. So we've seen this. We've seen this already start to explode, which is contactless payments, uh, scanning and going yourselves. But, you know, that's a really powerful point at which to get the consumer to identify themselves as well. So there's so many technologies. I think I always talk about the Hemar store, um, Fresh Hippo stores in 
China. If you see what they do, they, they have um, uh, electronic shelf edge labels that are bi-directional that allow you to not only add the product to your basket, but find out its provenance. So it's, it gives you that transparency in the experience as well. They have theatre because um, obviously Chinese culture, they like their live seafood. You can sit there and eat. You can have that food cooked in front of you. You can visit a checkout if you want to, but you can check out so, um, scan, buy, scan and go. And the most powerful thing I, I, I took away from hearing the CEO of Fresh Hippo speak at NRF two fateful years ago now, not, not knowing it would be my last visit to New York for a while, um, there was an audible gasp when he says, most of my online orders come from within a three mile radius of my store. I don't have to spend any money on digital customer acquisition. My customers come to me. And I think we're only now in this side of the world starting to understand, I think it was to David's point, forgive me if I get the, the, the gentleman who said this wrong, the sim channel symbiosis, the symbiotic relationship that exists between stores and online. And actually stores are hugely powerful, a draw in that sense. And I think retailers have underestimated how important a part they have to play in omni-channel, in an omni-channel um, world, but they have to facilitate that. They have to expose that capability to consumers through digital. Um, and I've named loads and loads of technologies there. I mean, I liked, I liked an example that Phoenix tried for a while, which was beacons, and they in, embedded beacons in their mannequins so that if you were opted in and open to it, it could ping you via app and say, check this outfit out. Here, I'll take you to it. And here's a bundled offer for you to buy it, try it on. By the way, the store assistant will be standing there at the, at the, the um, entrance to the dressing room to say, you look lovely. And if you don't have time to buy it right now, I'll check you out here, right here and now and deliver it to your office or deliver it to your home. That's the kind of seamless experience we need and it all needs to be enabled by digital. So I will stop talking there. I think we're up to time. Um, that's me, that's the book I've written with, with, with Tim, um, Tim Mason from Tesco's. And if you're interested in buying it, I've got your little 20% discount if you just use Omni Channel 20, but you have to go to Kogan Page, the publisher's website in order for that to work. Um, yeah, going to Amazon. Amazon's not going to offer you a discount, unfortunately. <laughs> but hopefully I've been able to give you um, some food for thought there and also start to answer the, um, add some more detail to the answer for that, that last question, Frank. Yeah, no, that that's fantastic, Maya. Thank, thank you for that. We do have we do have a few more minutes left, guys. So, um, and and I can see the uh, the chat panel has been has been very active as you've been oh, talk, talking your way through there, Maya. So, um, so if we um, if we just uh, again. Shall I, um, come out of this. So that yeah. We well, listen. I, I if you yeah, I mean, keep. I will. I will share my screen now. In fact, yeah. And, All uh, right, great. I'll give you a chance to queue that up, and then that I may, will. That means I will. I will lose my chat. So, uh, if oh, I see. Pick up on that. In fact, thinking it through. Um, yeah. I will. I will. I will stay on. I will stay. Just stay on yours just now. Okay. No worries. Yeah, and then when when I finish, I'll I'll, I'll pop over, um, but yeah, I mean, I, th there's one great point here which um, uh, which was made by again by David. So thank you for your contribution today, David. Um, David Spittle, he, he's saying here the perceived problem with retail apps is is value. It currently it is currently measured by sales increase rather than engagement value. Which I guess is is a very yeah. I mean, these days this you know this world that we live in. You know, it not only is, is value there, but I mean, it, seen as an increase in sales and, and certainly it, it's something which I have just recently in discussion with a partner up in Iceland and a particular airport um, uh, application which we're dealing with, uh, with our K3 Imagine app, in fact, have specifically been asked, how does this app, how does this app actually increase my sales? How does it increase my sales in the bar? How does it increase my sales in the um, in the re in the restaurants? Yeah, and and we have an app which is known as the table order pay or the tops app, and 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 typically in that that particular app, 
we can see uh, increases uh, you know, throughout the industry using apps like that of between 30 to 40 percent actually on on their overall revenue through those types of engagements. Um, but not only uh, you know, are there, um, I guess, you know, is there the increase in the sales element, but there's also, if you like, the reduction in cost. So there's, you know, with one side, there's always the, you know, the other, the other side to consider as well. And I guess, um, Maya, from, you know, I mean, certainly, is that something that you've come across before? And, and uh, you know, certainly with your time at Eagle Eye, I, I know you've been very much involved in, in that mobile world. So, um, you know, yeah. is there anything, anything you can share with us on that? Yeah, so um, I'm actually doing some work with a mobile app firm at the moment. <laughs> it's quite funny. We talk about belief in app and how, the, frankly, the e-commerce, um, who'd have thought they'd become stalwarts, um, have are trying to basically create a walled garden. They've become the oracles and the... Um, the IBMs of old, I think, you know, when we used to talk about being trapped by legacy, I think the last 10 years, certainly in the Western retail landscape, um, your demand wares and your ATGs have become the oracles of, of, the, of the 80s and 90s. Um, and I would also say that, yes, yeah, so there is definitely there's still a lot of education to be done around with retailers around winning hearts and minds over to apps. I mean, I would say if you're a wedding retailer, I, if you don't have that frequency, high touch, you might be high touch, but you're certainly not high frequency, you'd hope not to be. Um, you might not need an app. But um, if you see your, your customer, if you want to see your customer more than once a year, then I think it's worthwhile investing in it. And it's the same argument to be made about measuring the value of apps, that is to be made about measuring the value of stores in today's world. I mean, there are some, um, you know, influencers, gurus out there talking about the store as media. Um, I think that's a very good way of thinking about it. It goes to the point that I was making that the Fresh Hippo stores in China can actually measure the digital influence um, on their store. They can me measure the digital uplift. Um, and I don't think retailers, on this side of the world are capable of doing that unless they use their best customers and those that are those that are that shop with them both on in store and online as a baseline. Um, yeah, I, I, I honestly think that if I if I can trace my best customer's journey from engaging with me on the website buying, you know, do, doing a couple of purchases, getting a discount to download the app, downloading the app, coming into the store, having a fitting service, checking out, going home, building a wish list. I'm really getting a 360 degree view of that person's journey, but I'm also getting an, an equally measurable uh, baseline of what level of influence, what attributable mm -hmm influence that medium that channel has had on um on that that purchase that sale that customer lifestyle lifetime value if they've come in via social media if they've come in via paid search all of that i, I don't know that any retailer can join all that up in, in one go um, across one customer across one journey much as less across the customer's lifetime i think those that have loyalty schemes have come closest um, and I noticed, for example, Morrison's has just said no more plastic cards. Thank you very much. You have to use the app. Um, so, yes, I think there is definitely yeah. an issue about measuring value, but it has to be measured in an omni-channel way. It's not just the, the sales uplift on app. You yeah. might find a massive sales lift on app after they visited the store. I mean, absolutely. you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Maya, we've got, we, we've got some really interesting discussion going on just now in the, in the chat panel. Uh, regarding uh, one of our, our customers um, in, I believe it's their, their in Greece, and I think uh, between Laura and uh, Spiridis, I think uh, if if I can open up to either either Laura or, or Spiridis Dimitris to to discuss how our K3 kiosk app, in fact, is is assisting uh, the IKEA to to help with the that whole connection with with the customer uh, through there. Hi guys. Hi. Yeah, I, 
I invited uh, Dimitris uh, for the chat because um, we have uh, installed the kiosk in uh, in Greece. So maybe Dimitris, you would like to share something uh, about the values currently. Fantastic. Uh, yes. Hi everyone. Um, yes, what uh, we saw actually, uh, we had the opportunity to implement kiosks um, in Greece, in IKEA Greece, in uh, Athens Airport Store, uh, just uh, a month before uh, lockdown. So we have a quite good um, uh, data and um, we saw uh, very, very impressive figures um, regarding um, waiting times uh, in the bistro where uh, IKEA sells hot dogs, that's our area. And uh, there was a clear, um, uh, when we do the comparison, there was a, 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 an overall improve on that. Um, more than uh, approximately 18% of the customers uh, during peak hours were using this, uh, the kiosks, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, since it is a quite a, a quite new tool uh, for our customers, and uh, we also noticed that these were increased sales, uh, which means um, uh, we're over and above of regular sales. Because actually, we tend to lose customers when they see a long queue. So when you have this uh, convenience to make your purchase from an easier way without having to wait, um, that's actual, actually more sales. And um, the last input I would like to share uh, it was the convenience of the, um, of, the, of the interface. It was a very, it is a very, it is a very um, easy to use uh, tool. And um, this result, to improve sales because actually when I have the time uh, to see the whole range, then I tend to get, I uh, tend to purchase more products. Uh, I, I can I can talk for a couple of hours if you want. Uh, that's that's <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Thank, thank, thank you for that. So, um, yeah. Is there is there anybody anyone else uh, who wishes to ask any questions or if there are any further observations or or thoughts? No. There was a, there was a couple of things I thought I'd, I'd, I'd just sort of bring in. See what you thought, Maya. I mean, the thought process that I sort of constantly consider is like this fear factor around uh, around data um this kind of um this this whole connected experience is still quite terrifying for some people that don't give across their data unless they see the value and it's just something i thought might be quite interesting you know in, in reference to that kind of sustainability angle as a, a point of loyalty a reason to keep connecting the sustainability piece and actually quite interestingly that kind of loyalty to your local area you mentioned in the us you've got that kind of three mile radius around some of these stores i just thought perhaps it might be worth reflecting on people and their fear factors when coming to to that digital experience and how how we can kind of provision retail how we can kind of uh, approach that and, and cross that chasm a bit or whether it's been crossed <laughs> um no, I think there's definitely more we can do. There's always more retailers can do, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I'm I'm just to, to draw it out into some concluding points in that sense. I, I say that the only way retailers can come out of this tumultuous period better positioned is um, is to mitigate their risk and build their resiliency by knowing their customer. And they're going to need to invest in digital to do that. When they know their customer, they'll kind of start to re realize that it is not one size fits all. And actually what you're seeing is retailers trying to go still go global, but at local. 
So in the back end, they're diversifying and decoupling their supply chains to manage peaks. But at the front end, they're also, when they're decoupling, they're maybe saying, okay, well, I'm going to move some of my sourcing more locally so that I can reflect that localized range in store to my customers as well. Um, I think Aldi and Lidl are brilliant at doing that. I mean, in this country, you wouldn't guess that they were German retailers, the way they invest in their marketing with the, the British, um, uh, the GB Olympics team, for example, uh, one of them. And do you see what I mean in that sense that I think it's going to be really, really important to take that that point I made about relevance and make mm. sure it applies not just across the customer engagement piece, but the total customer offer in terms of what they're seeing in store as well. Yeah, not just driven by price, as it were, yeah. but, but for that added value kind of broadness. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, to the uh, the great IKEA case study um, that, that, that was shared just now, you know, I think it might be that they go in intending to buy the most the cheapest product but if you show them a larger range if you show them a range that has some kind of that that, that draws some kind of emotional loyalty from them as well they might be willing to trade up mm. yeah absolutely. absolutely cool great stuff okay that's that's lovely maya thanks any 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 other any other points observations i, I see a hand up oh bye Maya, hi, I'm Kate. It's lovely to meet you, and uh, thank you so much for this. It's been uh, been amazing. So I, I've got an interesting uh, an interesting question. So uh, I've been having a, a number of conversations um, recently um, around sort of different retail environments, and uh, I'm going to reflect um, particularly on transport and transport hubs because obviously COVID has driven a massive change. Um, now in, in passenger and passenger demands um, and there's a lot of uh, questions around what do we do with these assets and how do we now repurpose those assets into much more sort of social community experiential environments and then how do we connect through digital the whole thing together I'd love to know your thoughts on some of that well um I like I like talking about travel one because I miss it <laughs> two I did um I did a uh, I hate to still came through thunder, but I did a whole thing with um, uh, Kate. Come back to me afterwards. I can't remember the name. Actually, no, I can. Portland Design. A whole um, see, they did a whole series of webinars during last year, um, sort of around Octoberish time, about airport travel. Mm -hmm. And I got almost as excited as I do when I talk about retail, when I talk about tra um, travel and leisure, because actually they have even more reason for me to engage digitally because it's not only potentially one of the most exciting things we do traveling but it's also one of the most stressful things we do in terms of being on time getting from a to b on time this is where i need wayfinding this is where if you're a restaurant let me know how long the wait time is so that i know i can fit this meal in before i get to my gate or if it's a train station you know can i stop for for a meal will i get an alert what I think it's hilarious. Have you ever noticed how all the coffee shops and restaurants in train stations and the pubs that are in, in, in transport hubs, it's the tables around the screens that are always filled first <laughs> because people want to sit and enjoy their time without having to constantly keep referring to their watch or their device. They have confirmation their train is pulling in, their train is at platform, et cetera, et cetera. To me, it just seems even more of a digital imperative in these places to connect up the dots between the dwell retail leisure experience and the getting from A to B bit. Um, and the final thing I'll say on it is um, I actually think the next place that's ripe for disruption with the kind of Amazon Go model is, is, is travel retail. I think, you know, well, duty-free, you need to watch out because <laughs> the Amazon Go, because right now Amazon's focused on utility and function and grocery and convenience, which by the way it needs because it doesn't have that store presence and it needs to see that 360 degree view of us and we shop more food than we do anything else. But it does, it also really struggles when it comes to luxury and high value customers and high fashion. And if you were to kind of take that just walk out technology and plop it in a world duty free, 
how many rich business people and you know do you think would just jump at the opportunity to go oh, I love that I'll have that I'll have that I'll take that and not have to worry yeah. I think you know that's an apex example again of, of what can be done with the technology but I think it's, it's right for disruption that area it really really needs it you know and having that as a, a truly integrated e-commerce is actually quite intelligent as well isn't it yeah exactly exactly let me let me browse online before. I mean, I know these 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 services exist, but they don't market them terribly well. I don't know that they that they actually exist. That but when I'm before I'm going to the to, to the to the airport, engage me before the journey so that I know that I can do yeah. some pre shopping, for example. This yeah. is so the art of the possible. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Really interesting. Thank you for that. Fantastic. No Thank you, Kate. So is, is uh, anybody else out there that uh, has got a final, um, I'm just aware of people's time now, um, if there's any further, I, I, I can't see the, the chat box now guys, so if uh, Maya, Kelly, if there is anything there, if you can perhaps hark up, um, otherwise... Nothing. Nothing as yet, no, but I should just say thank you to Spiridis. I didn't remember his name at the time. That was a great um, IKEA kiosk case study. Thank you for adding to that. Absolutely. No, it was, it's just an example of how things are connected and, and some of the some of the experience, I think, which he, he shared with us there on the, uh, you know, on, on the whys and, and, and the, the, if you like, the, the return on the investment which he's getting there, I think is, is fantastic. Yeah, so thank again. Yeah. So if there is anything else, um, uh, you know, reach out to us afterwards, guys. Uh, I'd just like to sort of bring this to a conclusion now. Uh, say thank you to Maya for such an insightful and informative session this morning. Uh, and of course, to you, uh, uh, the attendees, um, always appreciate people taking time out of their busy schedules. Even in COVID days, I know how busy people's diaries do tend to get, uh, but uh, thank you for engaging with us. Um, hope you feel it was a constructive use of, of your time. Um, and, and just to remind you all that uh, the, we will be sending out a, a copy of our recent consumer research uh, over the next few days, adapt, called Adapt or Fail, meeting customer needs in the now. So in the meantime, Thanks again for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. So uh, bye for now.